everyone. I'm Lexi Fedorov, as you have heard already, and my topic today is microservices and mobile. This is a very strange topic, by the way. Um, I want to ask you some question. So who is wearing here di uh, different colored socks on your legs? Anybody? No? <laughs> I'm the only one, okay. So um, I'll just uh, tell you a bit of my, about myself. So I'm Alexi Fedorov. I'm a software crafter. So I'm really, really into code quality, clean code, clean architecture, uh, test-driven development, um, all the extreme programming practices, and also a bit into lean. So I like to um, deploy products that are not finished to get uh, feedback from users. And also, you can follow me on Twitter. OK. So I also work at Pivotal Labs. Um, who have heard about Pivotal? Uh, do you know the difference between Pivotal and Pivotal Labs? And I'll tell you. So Pivotal is a big company. They do a lot of stuff like Spring or uh, Cloud Foundry. And Pivotal Labs is a division of Pivotal, and we do consultancy. So we help clients to get to the agile and lean and all those things. OK? So I work for, as a software engineer, and I basically pair with client developers for 100% of my working day. We do have some meetings. Probably it's two hours per week. It's amazing. So now I have another question for you. Um, who is a software engineer here? OK. So who is everybody else? Just tell me. Like, um, maybe you're a developer. Uh, who, who is not a developer here? OK, so what are, what are you doing? Um, OK, you, you can say that. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, ops is still kind of developer. And I think developer should also be kind of ops. But that's just, that's just me. I'm weird. OK. Uh, and who did any mobile development in any form before? OK. Why some crowd? OK. Oh, also, me too. Uh, that's why I'm here today. So I want to uh, tell you a story about the single if statement. I want to give you some backstory before. So Johan and I, uh, we were working on a mobile app. It was in Swift. Um, I was showing uh, for our users certain places on the map. Um, our users were majorly interested in opening hours for those places. We were using third-party API to uh, get data about the places, what they are, where they are, and especially the opening hours. Um, that is exactly what we were interested in and our users. So the story is about opening hours. So if you take a look at the documentation of that API, that's how it will look like. You have opening hours, uh, 9 to 14, 17 to 23. Uh, it's basically a list of pairs uh, of starting hour and ending hour. Everything worked amazing. So we deployed to production. Uh, we got some first users. We got feedback. And then suddenly, uh, it was not so fine anymore. Uh, we started getting reports for our app uh, that there is some bug related to opening hours. Apparently, there were some places that had a weird numbers in them instead of hours. So we, we actually struggled to debug that problem because we couldn't see those numbers ourselves. So we got some fuzzy reports and we couldn't reproduce them. Finally, after a week or so of struggle with one pair, uh, we found uh, one place like that. So this is what you would see on the screen. It's a text. On the screen, you will see it much more fancy, but that's the gist of it. Um, it would actually consistently, every time when we hit that place, show those numbers. So like big number and empty for end time. Um, it was actually very challenging to find error in our code because everything seemed to work. And if you debug, um, it was just happening, and you couldn't find why. Finally, we realized that. API returns that value. And so we render it, essentially. Um, 
it was mentioned anywhere in the API, so we contacted sub, uh, support. Like we read an email to our person who was working with us uh, within that third party company. And they replied that, oh, there are a few numbers like that. Uh, there were a total of 25 numbers. They sent us a list, and obviously we needed to support them. Uh, they didn't update the documentation to the date, I think, which is funny. So um, at this point of time, uh, our users were quite frustrated, not all of them, but some of them, because when you go uh, outside of the center of the city, those places were uh, popping up quite often. So we did a quick check on the, our log login tool, uh, and we have seen that the 24-7 was uh, like 90% of those cases. So we decided, okay, let's just uh, make a hot, very quick fix for 24-7. And it took us really just one if statement, one test to test that it actually work, and one commit. We did it in five minutes or something. And then we deployed, and everybody was happy. Right, uh, except that I just lied. Nobody was happy because we had to wait another four days until our uh, release to Apple Store was um, checked manually and our app was updated on our user side. And also, not all uh, of our users have automatic updates enabled, which is a fun thing. So wh what do you think? Wouldn't it be great if uh, that was the case, that we just deployed and our users became immediately happy? I personally think it would. So I think that uh, we as industry, we deserve to be able to uh, deploy to production quickly. So if we have value that is there for user and we can give it, then we should give it. So let's imagine that um, the bug was not that, that simple and was much worse. So for example, um, instead of broken UI, uh, we would have um, an application that lies to our user in some way. So UI is not broken, application works, everything works. Uh, it's just that our users, as a result of their experience, become unhappy, and we lose users, and potentially lose the revenue. And imagine that is so bad that we're losing revenue with each coming day, like 20% of our revenue. So like we're just losing users uh, by tens of thousands. It would be nice to be able to find the bug very quickly and at least deploy hotfix. Actually, uh, for our vendors, when you deploy to Google Play Store or App Apple Store, it's possible to send them email and say, this is critical fix for critical bug. But the question is what they consider a critical bug. So what I just described wouldn't be considered a critical bug. At least, it, it wasn't in my experience. What would be considered is broken UI uh, when app crashes, so those sort of things like uh, hard bugs. But if you have logical bug and application kind of works, it's just not, not of good quality, then it's not considered a critical bug, and you cannot, you have to go through the whole process of release. So I was talking about the process of release, and a lot of people raised their hands who uh, worked with mobile, so you know how release to mobile works. I'll still tell you um, quickly what is it about. Um, basically, um, I build my feature, like on a branch, a master, whatever, and I want to deploy it. So I will uh, build a special artifacts using a CLI tool or my ID, um, and then I will upload that artifact to vendor. Um, then I will make an API call, or I will press a button in UI of the vendor website or something, um, and it will trigger the uh, release process for this artifact. Then. Uh, there will be people who will actually check how, you up, how my application works. If it actually matches uh, screenshots that I provided, that it actually matches the description and category and those things. Also, they will check that I'm not violating any terms of service and terms of conditions. Also, they will check that I'm not uh, trying to reach to any hidden APIs that uh, my platform has and not doing anything weird. Um, some of those checks are actually automated, which I think is great. Um, and also, uh, it takes this process takes uh, two to four days right now, which I think is pretty good, um, comparing to what it took one year and a half ago, where it was nine, eleven days. 
Um, additionally, um, I think it's actually a good, good thing on their side that they're improving this process. Um, I think the point of my talk and why I'm here is that uh, somehow, as industry, we need to tell our uh, vendors that uh, it's not quite acceptable to have a manual review uh, during release like that. Um, maybe it's not acceptable to have it synchronous. Maybe it should be asynchronous or something. But as if I have value that I want to deliver to user, I should be able to immediately. So. Um, that's, that's a problem that I'm calling mobile waterfall. Um, uh, I have a blog post on that. You can read about it um, in more details. But basically, it's what I, what I said, that uh, two, four days, you have to wait until it's released. And you're lucky if it is, because sometimes there will be some, something weird and uh, some um, review, manual reviewer will not understand something in our description and will say that our app doesn't do what it does. And then we'll have to write emails and figure out how to uh, fix that situation that could take one or two more days. Also, if I get rejected by some valid reason, I would have to um, uh, fix the problem and then push for release again, which would uh, again take two, four days. So it might take eight days in the worst case scenario. What that means for us developers? That means a very interesting thing, that uh, if, I have, if I have a bug fix, as, as we thought uh, before, if I ha already have it done, uh, I'll still have to wait half a week until my user gets the value. If I want to test assumption, you know I'm um, a lean guy, so uh, if I have an assumption that a uh, user would like that, I would just build it, uh, I would just build it as simple as possible and will uh, push it to, want to push it to 1% of my users, but I can't. I can't do the canary release, really and check what, what would be the result. Uh, that is because for canary release to be effective, I need to get uh, feedback in minutes. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Otherwise, it would be more efficient to uh, invite uh, users in my office for user testing. That would be more efficient. So canary release is the practice that uh, a lot of companies uh, use, not, in mobile, not on mobile platforms, of course. It's super useful, but we can't quite use it. Um, also, because it's, uh, the cost of screening up is so high, uh, we'll write uh, much more UI tests, so end-to-end -end tests. So because we will actually try to really, really make ourselves confident that it works, that there are no user-breaking experiences, there are no uh, bad quality decisions that our software makes, which makes build slow and flaky, which uh, leads to the problem of broken window where, um, yeah, our build is slow, whatever, we'll just not run it, or um, yeah, I'm not running build locally because it takes so much time. So every time I push my changes to, um, to Git or whatever you're using, um, CI breaks, and then it's right all the time. And then at some point, um, it's just flaky, it just fails all the time. And at some point, developers just start not caring about it. Yeah, it just fails, it's just random, even though there is bug, a real bug there. And then somebody in three days discovers, oh, it was not a flaky failure, it was actually a real failure. Interesting. So next problem that we have is that, um, as in end-to-end -end testing, you would also do more QA, like you would test more manually because uh, this is all about making yourself confident that you can release. It's not necessarily applies like that. I'm, I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but basically that's where teams can go. So because they don't have any other way to protect themse themselves from this failure. So as more failures like that occur, the more team will go in the direction, which I think as extreme programmer uh, is not the best direction that team can go to. Um, anybody heard about uh, features like beta users, test flight? Probably you did, right? Okay, I, I see uh, nodding. Okay, so this is the um, feature where uh, you would be able to deploy your, release your application without any review to certain group of people. Um, it's either like special testers that are registered for it um, or 
people inside of your company, things like that. So, uh, and I also get the question during that talk sometimes. Uh, aren't beta users enough? Can't I test my assumptions on beta users, for example, if I wanted to? Um, and my answer to that question is actually a question on its own, uh, which is, uh, can I deploy 10 versions at the same time? And as far as I know, I can't. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, getting back to on the track, so how can we get our feedback back? There are a few ways. For example, not build a mobile app. <laughs> That's a funny one, especially for mobile developers. Um, yeah, there, there is an uh, interesting blog post there that discusses why native app can be good and why web app on, on browser can be good. And that has a few of upsides and downsides. I will not actually go in detail on that because uh, you can find those things on the internet yourself, really. Um, and I will get quicker to the point where I will get to microservices. So there are, there is web app. Also, you can build a progressive web app, which is uh, a nice feature of that uh, technology is that you, you're still building a web app, but it can feel for the user as a, a native app because you, they can install it to their home screen and it can run in full screen without like all the browser UI and stuff. Um, that has few problems of its own. And also, um, the major problem is that users are just not, um, they don't know that feature, first of all. And when they know about it, they might think that this is somebody trying to scam them. Uh, that's what I, I've seen people react to that. Um, and also, it's just not the usual place for them to find apps. It's not usual for them to go to some website that shows them an app and a bubble that says, oh, you can click that button, then find that thing in the menu, click on it, and then you'll have your app installed. It's like, what? I'm usually installing apps through the uh, Play Store. What, what do you mean? <laughs> so um, while that is good, um, there is next. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot about it. This presentation is actually a progressive web app. So if you trust me, you can uh, go to that link. Uh, Bitly, Microservices, Mobile, C, C stands for Code Europe. Um, and if you're on mobile phone, where that supports progressive web apps, you can try to um, install it to your home screen. Usually do that by in sharing options. And it'll actually work, uh, I think it actually works offline. I think it works offline, even, which is nice. Or maybe I'm uh, wrong. So the third option that you have to the problem of mobile waterfall is uh, to run the hy hybrid application. Hybrid applications is uh, um, inter inter very interesting applications. They are actually na native apps that user knows where they install from. They go to App Store, or Play Store, or whatever, um, find that the application and install it. But under the hood, it's basically a, a kind of like a browser in, inside of your application. Uh, that has all the JavaScript, HTML5, and everything. And it has a bit of um, bridges, so-called bridges that um, combine two worlds, where you can call from your JavaScript native code. And most often, you will have some framework for building hybrid application, where there are a lot of those bridges, so that a lot of work is already done for you, and you have a lot of things available on, in your JavaScript side. But, um, Sometimes you have to implement your own bridges. So if you're writing hybrid application, it's still probably a good idea to have a native developer on the team, at least somebody who has experience with that. Um, I'll also skip pros and cons. You can find that. And finally, I'm uh, going back on track to my talk, which is roll your own solution. Um, it's interesting because you can't read about that on the internet. Uh, and this is something that I did because um, Somebody, uh, one year ago, somebody challenged me to do that. So I was like, no, no way that's possible. How can I do microservices on mobile? So I did that. And also, uh, I, I used that in one production application, not in the whole application, but only in part of the application. We chose a module that was, was being changed mo most often. And we applied that pattern. So I'll show you how it looks like. I'm not going to present you any libraries or frameworks. So I'm actually like, I'm clean code and architecture guy. So I, I like architectural styles. 
that I they could be encapsulated in frameworks and libraries. I just don't do that because, I mean, I, I don't want to maintain framework. <laughs> I just want to uh, build things because I'm a developer. Um, so let's imagine that you would have a domain-specific language that is being deployed to your servers. So you don't deploy that as part of your bundle um, to the to App Store or Google Play Store. Then uh, it is being parsed and interpreted by your mobile application. Basically, your mobile application is uh, one big interpreter for some pseudo programming language. I will show you a small example of uh, what I did for initial search for that thing. Uh, let's imagine that we have an application that uh, renders a list of item, items. Those items um, are maybe products or images or photos, whatever. And you can, a user can like them. So that's already what is implemented. And now you have a product manager who says, oh, I, I just backed from user uh, interview, and they really want to see recommendations, what else they could like. So we have the uh, feature like that. When user likes an item, we would like to show them recommendations. So in the example that I was doing in research, I would have a, I would basically write a new JSON file. That was my DSL. It was in JSON. It could be better, but JSON was easier. Uh, so it would be a recommendation service that subscribes to an event called liked item and execute an action called request uh, to the endpoint recommendations with uh, this little interpolation there. Why that doesn't work? With this interpolation, as you can see. So it takes item ID from the event, inserts it into string, and will execute that API request to the API, API gateway or API host, because API gateway nowadays is from serverless, right? It wasn't before. And then it will publish to different uh, Oh, that's interesting. I'm sorry. OK. It will publish to different um, topic on uh, a message bus called Receive Recommendations. And that is something that you would receive from your API. So this is, if I fetch uh, my example.org web servers uh, with this URL, I'll get this service. This is my JSON. Next. I'll implement second service, which I would call recommendation render service, where I will subscribe to a uh, topic receive recommendations. This is the same topic that we published just now from uh, to, and I will execute uh, action to render a view called item list with data from uh, event response items, which is also interpolation, and it will basically pass in the object, the data structure. And that's also returned from our service and finally, I will have a list of all services returned from API, which is uh, basically URLs where I can find each one, single one of them. So this is very close to metaprogramming, where you basically, where you could program your program. And that is because it, it basically is. And it has a bunch of trade-offs. For example, such application can be rejected because um, 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 when, when there, there is a review, they're actually trying to understand what are you doing with, within code. And if it's weird, then they will reject it. So for example, if they see that, oh, there is some interpreter, uh, why is there an interpreter for some weird language? So they will reject it. And that, that is not a big issue because you can always uh, send them email and explain what you're doing. And as long as your application is good, uh, they, they will be okay with that. It's just that you need to fight email battle, probably 10, 20 emails there and back. Uh, but essentially, it's possible to deploy that. And there are companies that deploy that. For example, um, uh, last time I checked, maybe that changed, or it was uh, half a year ago. Half a year ago, for sure, Spotify was using similar concept for the old UIs in their application. So basically, the UIs was uh, were 
an analog of HTML5 and CSS, uh, but in JSON format. That, and Apple was basically rendering this stuff without actually using any browser. It was just a native app that could render a uh, format that was very similar to HTML and CSS. Um, there, there is a lot of complexity that goes into implementing the, such DSLs. Um, so you might want to not implement a full-blown DSL, uh, because when I say DSL, that could mean a lot of things. That could mean publish subscribe that I implemented. Uh, and this is like actually pretty neat, because you could, with publish subscribe, you can do a lot of things. Um, but you might want to implement things like feature toggles. So you have multiple features or multiple versions of the same feature. You deploy it, deploy it in a normal way, uh, like via the manual release that takes four days. And then you can uh, switch features for different uh, audiences, given their, like, I know, uh, user ID or something, um, and see which one performs better. So it's kind of like ABC test. And that's uh, basically the smallest uh, possible DSL that you can have, Small, smallest complexity. And as you grow complexity, you'll, you'll get more features. So you can decide client side. If you, if you get more features on DSL, you can, you can make decisions on what to show client side. And then it's no longer a feature toggle. It's more like a smart feature toggle with smart configuration. And essentially, the uh, more features you add to that DSL, the closer it will become to the programming language, which probably you don't want to maintain. So, and also, 5 to 10% uh, of that application will still be deployed old school. Remember this uh, when I said in those JSON files, there was request action and render view action. Those actions are, will be, it's, they are like uh, bridges in your hybrid application. So they are very analogous concept. What, what I love about it is that uh, you could choose your other trade-offs you can choose yourself. You're, not, um, you're no longer um, limited by any framework or library. You could just uh, say, OK, I want to go for performance, and you really make everything very performant. But then you trade off some developer productivity because it will be hard to write such uh, DSL. Or you can really make it really easy to write such DSLs. And also, for every new feature, you would practically just add new, new services, mostly. For different features, you would rewrite other services, and you can go for really good development cycles. Or if you are uh, some sort of agency that builds similar apps for different businesses, uh, and you know your domain well, then you can build a DSL framework for those apps, where it will be really cost efficient to build those apps and sell them. They will be slightly different, and this slight difference will be in that DSL. Yeah. So as I already said, that this DSL, the more complex it is, the closer you are to hybrid application, and the closer you are to programming language. Where did microservices happen? They actually happened. So microservices uh, have multiple properties. Um, they are componentization, where you're, you're having separate components that are uh, different from each other and have clear boundaries. As boundaries go, you have bounded contexts. So you can actually structure um, your services in a way that they correspond to your domain contexts of your business. They, they, have, they should have single responsibility uh, only, because if they do too much things, then you get uh, just, uh, just old monolith that is hard to change. They should be loose coupled, um, because it's important that uh, you can uh, change one microservice without uh, breaking 30 other microservices. And also, you could add multiple new microservices without breaking 20 other microservices. Um, they should be independently deployable, so you shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be forced to deploy all of them at the same time. And also, if you change two or three of them, you should be de able to deploy them in sequence. So deploy first one, see if it works, nothing broke. Deploy second one, see if it works, nothing broke. Deploy third one. Finally, um, it has uh, such thing like independence scalability. So, all those properties for the architecture that I just listed 
they are true except independent scalability. Because um, we cannot scale really those services. They are just single Ryan thread in, in our, inside of our application. And actually, this makes sense to scale it. Uh, you have only one user. On mobile app, you usually have only one user. So this is so-called pseudo-microservice architecture because we don't satisfy one criteria. And I'll show you how it looks like, how it actually works for this example. So there is a main program, like your main function, where, where you start. And whenever you start, and whenever you have internet connection, you would go to backend and check what other services are and fetch all the services and store them in your cache. Of course, uh, application deployed via Artifact, via App Store or, App, uh, or Google Play Store, comes with a preset of those uh, cached uh, services in case if your user starts the application when they lost the internet connection. Am I out of time? No, I'm not out of time. So, then next, uh, it takes all the services, either from cache or from backend, uh, runs them through the so-called DSL interpreter that interprets all those JSONs and, uh, makes, uh, and, and makes appropriate subscriptions to the message bus. And I'll uh, show what this message, bu message bus is in a moment. And then finally, um, how it will work for our use case. So when user likes an item, Item catalog service will publish like item event to the message bus. Um, next, recommendation service will be subscribing to that liked item uh, event and will uh, execute a request action for the endpoint um, recommendations 42, because 42 answered to the universe, and will communicate with backend and will uh, publish the response as an event to receive recommendations uh, topic. Then, finally, there is another service called Recommendation Render Service that would subscribe to that same topic that uh, other service just published to, uh, and will take the whole item list with the whole data and will render it. So we'll render item list with data from the event, and that goes to UI. So here, what's important is that item catalog service, recommendation service, and recommendation render service are all implement in DSL, therefore you can deploy them in the, uh, without uh, the long release cycle. So you can depo deploy them immediately. So on the next restart, users will get new functionality if they have internet. Um, request action, render action, um, and message bus are things that uh, you implement natively. Those are things that you, for example, message bus is basically a core of your of this architecture. So you will implement it um, just in uh, like in Java or Objective C or something, and then uh, request all the actions, all the different actions that you want to do. You will implement them also in native code. Okay. And finally, I want just to finish with one word that uh, the best alternative. To all, all uh, to this uh, best alternative solution to the problem is not um, it's not technical because technically we can solve the problem and they will all feel like hack. So hybrid um, hybrid apps they feel like hack. Running web in, as a progressive web app also feels like hack, especially when not all browsers support that. Um, all that is a hack for the problem that we cannot deploy immediately. And the proper solution for that problem is that we will be able to e deploy immediately if we can convince our, our vendors that we really need that. Because they have all the power to do that. I will, I will tell you why they, I think that they have all the power to do that. Because there is such concept like uh, synchronous review and asynchronous review. Whenever I, I release a new version, I get synchronous review. So my version gets queued, and it, while it's being reviewed, it will not be actually, it will not appear in App Store, and nobody will get updated, right? Um, now, if suddenly my application gets a lot of downloads, so it, it was getting not so much downloads, but then it suddenly gets a lot of downloads, or it gets a lot of reviews, no matter positive or negative, 
what is usually being triggered at this point is asynchronous review. Ju just in case they're reviewing the application again, even though it's already live in, in your store, uh, to check if that's still the same application and if it's not violating any of their te terms of conditions. Because, and if it does, uh, you, you might get into trouble. Like the worst case scenario is that you will be uh, a company that uh, owns the developer license will be banned forever from um, said store, like said vendor, which is pr probably pretty bad if you're a big, big company. Um, so I think that we should be continuing using all those techniques, either rolling your own, doing micro some microservices stuff, and suffering from complexity of DSL, or doing hybrid application or progressive web apps, and show, by, by doing that, show to our vendors that it is important for us to have a good uh, review process that is very quick, where we could deploy immediately. Uh, and this could be done because what if, imagine what would happen if the asynchronous review was the default option. So if we deploy the app, it's immediately in App Store. Uh, it could be not the initial deployment. Initial deployment might be the asynchronous review. But the update could be asynchronous, uh, where we would deploy an app, uh, users will already benefit from our update because we're a good company. We're not doing some bad stuff. Um, and then asynchronous review happens, and in four days, it might be concluded that we did something wrong, and then it will contact us and we'll fix the problem. Or if we bad company and do something bad, then they will ban us from App Store, and uh, uh, rightfully so. Of course, this, this has its own problems, and that there could be some nasty hackers who will create apps that look good and then do updates that uh, steal users' identities. Um, the problem is that um, it's quite costly to do, because you need to pay for developer license usually, and also you need to construct this application with all those uh, frameworks and patterns, and it takes time. It's just uh, it's very elaborate. Uh, it would be a very elaborate hack of the system. So I think it's possible. It's time for questions. Anybody has any questions? Uh, the question was if uh, services that I've shown, the JSON files, uh, are they implemented natively or are they just describing uh, on certain event, uh, execute that action? Uh, yes, on certain event, execute that action, that's a description. So um, native implementation looks uh, uh, as simple as uh, the cell interpreter will take those JSON files, parse them once and launch a subscribe action on the message bus. And it will, it will supply the appropriate function, like um, lambda or whatever, um, to the uh, subscribe block, where it will call the action with appropriate uh, options. Uh, it will do also interpolation of strings that if it finds one, uh, those and so on. Uh, so basically, whenever I want to change one of the JSON files, I'll just go and deploy them to my web server. And all the further restarts of the applications for users will have already updated functionality. But if I need to introduce a new action, like have request action, render action, uh, some other action like push notification action, maybe uh, get, get uh, geolocation action, and then suddenly I need uh, to start using camera, I'll have to implement actions in native code, and that would be proper release with uh, all the wait time. Like basically the same that would happen if you have a if you would implement hybrid application from scratch without using libraries and frameworks. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I think uh, we still have four minutes, and I will show you. Um, so. I, I actually did a demo for this. We don't have time to show the demo itself. I have a video, so you can follow the link if you want, or you can take a photo and follow. Is it readable? Okay, so you can take a photo and um, um, take a look at it after. I basically am implementing the use case that I was talking about, and it's only like uh, five minutes long. So in five minutes, I'm implementing it, and it's running on the app. Um, 
And I want just to show you the code, which I guess I will be able to do if I will to switch it, like my displays to do what? If I do that, I think you should be able to see what I see. Okay. So if I go to GitHub, um, is that? Oh, I don't have internet. That that's amazing. So I have two apps that I've written, like he likes, sty uh, like he likes static, which is a static uh, application, like it just serves JSON files. And this is where I was um, changing it. And then there is uh, iOS Swift application where I actually implemented all those things. I have only two means, but that's why I will show you the heart of the application, which is a message bus. So it, it's very simple. Uh, uh, I probably should make the font much bigger. Is it good? Even slightly more. So it's basically a publish subscribe, as simple as possible implementation because it was for demos, so I didn't go for like something super scalable, um, where you have two functions, publish, publish and subscribe. Publish uh, accepts topic um, an event which is both are strings, so basically everything that goes through uh, bus is uh, serialized JSON. And then it adds uh, uh, calls all the subscribers for that topic uh, and dispatches uh, on different thread and calls the subscribers. So everything is asynchronous. And then subscribe uh, just adds the handler function to the topic. So every topic has multiple handler functions. It's easy as that. You can't actually unsubscribe, and um, I didn't have to for this example. But probably it's good thing to have. And finally, the, um, the main function looks like that. And it's pretty interesting, because I used the cell interpreter to write it. So I was saying that uh, built-in the request services definitions, which would, um, on, on event start, it will execute request section with uh, options URL, services JSON, with timestamp because I was using the GitHub pages to host my static website, so it was, um, every time I was updating it, it was caching it, and so I couldn't up actually update, so I had to uh, introduce it, that timestamp to overcome that problem. But that's not what you would do in production. Uh, then extract services URLs, so it's basically action for each, uh, which would uh, go through the list of data that got in the event, and we'll uh, send every item of that uh, data of that list as a separate event to the uh, message bus on different topic. And then there is a handler for that, which uh, gets all the things and does another request for that URL and publishes the result to different uh, topic. Yeah, and we're out of time. And basically, that's how it works.